Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139. State Representative Jeremy Thiesfeld of Fond du Lac is a Republican seeking re-election in the 52nd Assembly District. Jeremy, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Well, thanks for having me, Steve. Well, you know, my first question is: You chair uh, Assembly Ed. You've been working on Ed. Uh, ed you've been working on education issues for a long time. Can I ask how you feel about the reopening pattern, where local schools are given the choice of in person? Do you think it's working pretty well? given the pandemic that we're all dealing with, sir? Yeah, I think so. Um, clearly, these are decisions that no matter what you do, you're not going to make everybody happy. Uh, you know, certain segments going to be upset no matter what. Uh, and you know, when you have a very diverse state, not just in terms of demographics, but uh, geographic as, as well as Wisconsin is, um, you know, you consider the schools up north and the schools in the southern part of the state, the schools in our urban areas and our suburban areas, uh, there just really is no reason why they all should have to adopt, abide by the same set of rules. And, and I think that applies not just to schools, it, it fittingly applies to your communities as well. Um, I, I, I struggle to see why a school up in Iron County uh, perhaps, uh, or some other northern county like that, should have to have the same rules as, say, Beloit uh, or La Crosse or Kenosha or Milwaukee. So I, I think that was a wise way for us to handle this, and uh, I, I think that it has been largely received well by the community. On September, on September 20, 20, on September 28th, 28th, the, um, the governor, the governor has, has, to has to either let lap the statewide mask edict or continue it. Uh, your hope is that he what on on the mask edict, sir? Well, to start with, there's there's dubious le there's dubious legality to his issuing the mask mandate. Uh, the, the legislature has let it go through. Um, I, largely, the public has been supportive of it, uh, but a lot of people in the state have their their target set on that when that is going to expire, and I I do not believe that it should be extended. Uh, I think statistically it has shown that it really hasn't made much difference. Uh, and it, it's one of these situations where, you know, you can, you can pass laws, you can give orders, but when people really just aren't going to follow them, it kind of really ceases to exist. And there has not been wide uh, acceptance of this across the state. And if you've gone to certain communities in different areas of the state, you see, very much compliance with it and you go to other places and you you very seldom see somebody who is in compliance uh, and so I, I don't think it's been particularly effective I believe there are better ways to accomplish this and I think we need to trust the population to uh, take care of each other a follow-up on the pandemic if there's a shortfall in general fund tax collections in the current year I'm gonna make up a number a billion um, how would you protect K-12 public schools, uh, uh, choice schools, charter schools, if, if we had a significant shortfall in tax collections? Well, thankfully, the current budget doesn't appear it's going to be uh, as struggling as we approach the end of it uh, in end of June next year. Uh, in fact, it's projected to even have a slight uh, positive margin at the end. Uh, so that's a positive thing. We maybe won't have to do a budget repair bill uh, which is something that statutorily kicks in at certain points. Uh, but I think that the real struggle is going to be particularly, uh, it's real struggle is going to be the next budget, particularly the first year of that budget. Uh, and I, I don't know of a candidate for the state legislature out there who isn't looking at the most important thing 
uh, in their campaign right now is getting the state's economy rolling again. You know, if we can get the economy rolling again, uh, a lot of this is going to take care of itself, particularly in that second year. But looking at that first year uh, and projected shortfalls, uh, I think we seriously have to look at freezing things uh, where they currently are in the second year of this budget, uh, okay. because uh, we we cannot raise taxes. You know, in hard economic times, that is the absolute worst time to raise taxes. And so, I, I think it's very important to recognize that it you know it's it's raining uh, in terms of the budget, and we have that rainy day fund also, which I believe has somewhere in the area of seven hundred million dollars in it. So that certainly is going to be helpful as well. Uh, one of the things is, do you apply it in the current budget or do we apply it to the next budget? The um, Let's talk about that first year in the next budget. Um, we've seen the high-profile role that hospitals have played nationally and in Wisconsin treating COVID-19. Do you think in the first year of that next budget, even though the, we, we may have to freeze some programs, hospitals deserve an even greater priority than they may have in the current one? Well, I think that we've taken that seriously in previous budgets. Um, we, we have rural hospitals that have been struggling for quite some time, and we don't want our rural residents to lack access to health care facilities. Uh, and so there was the disproportionate uh, share uh, provision that was in, I believe, in the last budget, which I think helped our rural hospitals. Uh, and in terms of health care, Wisconsin continues to rank at or near the top uh, in nationwide uh, a- analyses of that particular issue. Uh, so in terms of the next budget, you know, I, I think some of that's going to depend on the prevalence of the continuation of the um, coronavirus, uh, some sort of assistance with PPE to make sure that they're keeping up with that because, you know, frankly, they're having to, like all of us, they're having to take larger measures uh, of protection than what they have in the past. Uh, And so that might be a possible thing. Uh, But I think the biggest thing that we can do to help the hospitals out is to get them back to operating their normal business operations. For a while there, they were shut down pretty much just to deal with COVID and to prepare for that. Uh, I I think that once they were able to open up again and start doing the other procedures, uh, things will start start to flatten out for them. So certainly it's worthy of consideration, but I I, I think that just getting them back to normal operations is the most important thing we can do for them. Have you signed on to Rep. Borden's bill that says if you're an organization or a business and you've tried to comply with COVID protocols, to protect your patients, customers, or employees, you couldn't be sued over a COVID uh, incident? Is that a bill you, you, you can support? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, I, I have stated publicly that uh, one of the reasons I would be willing to go back into session would be to pass such a bill as that, okay. uh, because that has many businesses, uh, many private organizations, you know, county fairs, for that matter, schools, Uh, kind of frozen in place because they are very afraid that uh, all it takes is one case and all of a sudden a lawsuit comes down on their head. So if they are being vigilant and taking um, normal and perhaps enhanced normal uh, precautions uh, for people who are entering their doors, I I believe that we should give them those liability protections because, you know, the virus doesn't appear it's going to be going away anytime soon, but we've got to learn how to live with it. And part of that is going to be making sure that all of these important institutions in our communities uh, are able to continue to function. The debate over policing reforms played out has played out nationally and even, even in Kenosha. The governor's got nine bills, Senator Wangard, seven or eight. The speaker's going to form a task force. My question, is there any specific policing reform you think should be enacted, Representative? Well, of those bills that were presented, uh, you know, there, there were some that came uh, from that the governor wanted passed, uh, and then Van Wangard put out a package of bills as well. There are a number of things in there that I, I think are <laughs> good things for us to do. Uh, the banning of chokeholds, I, I don't think I have any issue with that. I certainly would want law enforcement to chime in on some of these things because they're the ones who have to deal with this, and I'm certainly no expert in 
their particular field. You know, required hours of training, that certainly is a logical thing. Um, uh, body cameras, uh, that there's a heavy cost to that, uh, but I think that ultimately those things turn out to be a good uh, for our officers and show that they actually were doing things appropriately. Uh, the, the use of force advisory boards, um, I think there was one in there about whistleblower protections, when one officer kind of reports the other. Uh, uh, there was a report to the DOJ, uh, or DOJ would put a, together an annual report on use of force incidents. So I don't really have a problem with all those. In fact, our, our former police chief here in the city of Fond du Lac uh, was the guy in charge of the Law Enforcement Standards Board at the Department of Justice for a period of time, and I've been talking with him about uh, which of these bills are appropriate and which ones are not really going to work out. As states around Wisconsin legalize medical and recreational marijuana, has that changed what you're hearing from your constituents in the 52nd? And what's your position on both those now? Uh, well, I haven't really heard much recently, actually. It was a period of time where there was a lot of commenting on it and, it, and it goes both directions. You have some people adamantly opposed and you have some people who are adamantly think that uh, it should be free and full legalized for whatever purpose anybody wants to do it. Uh, I, I have made a point of saying that if there can be proven medical uh, purposes for this, that I'm willing to explore that. I was supportive of the CBD oil, and I think that has proven to be a positive thing. But I, I think that we also have the advantage of looking at some other states who jumped into this uh, before we did. Um, whenever I've, back when we were able to go to national conferences, when I would go to them, I would specifically seek out people, other legislators from the states who have done much more than Wisconsin has to see what its impact has been, particularly Colorado, because um, while not being close to Wisconsin, it's, it's closer than some of these other ones. And I, I generally get two comments uh, from Republicans out here. They say, oh, don't do it. Don't do it at all. Uh, and then from the Democrats in those states, I'll see that I'll, I'll hear comments such as, well, there's been some good and some bad, but we probably should have thought it through better before we acted as quickly as we did. Um, so I think we're looking at the correct approach with this to make sure that before we take any measures like you know, legalization, that we are sure of what the impact is going to be. The governor wants a People's Maps Commission to draw the next congressional and legislative district lines and then forward it to the legislature to be enacted. What's your reaction to the governor's proposal? Redistricting is a constitutional requirement, obviously, and it has been placed in the hands of the state legislature. Uh, and so I am not willing to sacrifice the authority or the responsibility of the state legislature over to what is frequently labeled as a nonpartisan commission. You know, I, I, I frequently will tell people that uh, there's no such thing as nonpartisan. Um, I would think it'd be more accurate to label it a bipartisan commission. Anybody who sits down at a table to do so, that sort of thing is going to bring their political biases into the discussion. Uh, and so nonpartisan, I, I don't think that's possible. Bipartisan, that's worthy of discussion. But even so, um, the legislature has a responsibility to do this, and I'm not willing to see that go away. Historically, that's the way it's been done, and I don't really see any strong reason why it should change. Wisconsin is a high property tax state, which is why school districts and local governments have been living with caps and limits on what they can levy in property taxes. Should those caps and limits stay in place? Yes, they should. Uh, certainly I'm open to looking at adjustments to it possibly, or e even things that can be exempted from it. Uh, but prior to my time in the state legislature, I also served on a city council. And even though many in the city government were opposed to those limits, uh, I was in favor of them even at that time because it was a very effective tool for limiting the amount of spending that is laid on the taxpayers. I mean, if we didn't have these expenditure or if we didn't have these restraints, uh, I, I shudder to think the type of increases that uh, some of our communities would be seeing around the state. And 
besides that, uh, any community uh, school district in the state that finds itself in need of additional funding certainly has the opportunity to go to referendum, which many of them have done. I don't have a problem with that, where you put it to a vote of the citizens and whether or not they want to raise their own taxes. As a uh, former city council member, is it time to consider giving local governments revenue options so they're not so reliant on the property tax? Uh, Representative Goyke, of course, has a bill that after passage of a referendum, Milwaukee could levy a half cent sales tax. Do local governments need new alternative sources of revenue? I, I think that that kind of falls along the referendum lines. You know, you, if your local community is willing to do something like that, then it should be put to a referendum. Um, I, I, I guess I'm not excited about the state uh stepping in and I'm not, I'm not excited about the state giving the opportunity for communities to essentially tax particularly their senior citizens out of their homes. Uh, and the statewide, we have seen many referendums that have passed. Uh, and so the, I, I don't understand the reluctance to doing them if, if they've been successful, uh, why not let the communities vote on it? Um, and let's not have this huge reliance on the state to constantly fund our operations. Governor Evers last year, as you know, recommended raising our gas tax, which is now 30.9 cents per gallon. Hasn't been raised in more than 10 years. Are you any closer to considering raising the gas tax, Representative? Well, I've said all along that I believe the fairest way to do this uh, is through the gas tax. Uh, you know, whether you live in Wisconsin uh, and pay that gas tax every time you put gas in your car or you are from a neighboring state that travels here and does the same. You're, you're all having to pay for it. Uh, the problem that we've got, uh, and it's well documented, is that as we've had higher mileage cars and we've had the advent of hybrids and electric cars, there aren't as many gallons of gasoline being purchased. And so th therefore the revenue from that has not been keeping pace. And so therefore other options have been considered such as tolling. Uh, while I'm not really all entirely opposed to tolling, what I am opposed to is the infrastructure that needs to be built to accomplish it. Um, and so if there needed to be an increase in uh, transportation funding, I would lean towards the gas tax because I think it's the cleanest, most efficient way to do it. Uh, but considering the state of the economy right now, I, I'm not up for raising any taxes. When a school district or a local government plans a major public works project, should they have to give a preference to uh, a Wisconsin business? I'm uncomfortable with requiring a local community or a school district to have to pay more for a project um, because ultimately, of course, who's paying for that? The taxpayers are paying for it. So they, they shouldn't be required to pay more for a project uh, just because that particular uh, company happens to be from Wisconsin. This is especially a big deal for our border communities because they're going to get bids on projects from communities that are right across the border and say Illinois or Minnesota or Iowa. Uh, and they those businesses have to be able to compete with each other too. And so ultimately that competition doesn't just end at the state borders. Lastly, uh, you wanna highlight differences between you and your opponent on November 3? Well, I, I don't believe I've ever personally met my opponent, to tell you the truth. So I, I'm not inclined to be critical without having met her. Uh, you know, politics is about relationships. So I'll, I'll just leave it at this, you know, when, when People cast votes for local offices, such as your towns, your school boards, etc. And I believe state assembly applies to that as well. They mostly want to know that they have access to you. Uh, and, and frankly, do they like you? Uh, policy difference sometimes comes in third place. So le legislators have to make decisions and you cannot always give a response that every constituent wants to hear. Uh, and anybody who has been paying attention to my time in office, uh, they cannot realistically say that I have not been open to all of my constituents. I have held numerous town halls. I've uh, been willing to meet oftentimes personally with anybody who has asked. 
Uh, I don't believe I've ever denied anybody. And so uh, while I have been continuing that in this campaign by being out walking the streets, uh, sometimes riding my bike out in our rural communities to knock on doors and hear what constituents have had to say, uh, my opponent has been campaigning in front of a computer screen by putting out tweets and Facebook posts. Uh, so she is not taking advantage of the opportunity to hear what the constituents have to say. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of policy differences, and while those certainly are important to people, I think the most important thing is is that, you know, I'm I'm getting together and meeting with people personally, and I have been a very visible member of this community. Thank you. State Representative Jeremy Thiesfeld of Fond du Lac is a Republican seeking re-election in the 52nd Assembly District. The election is November 3. Representative, thank you for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thanks for having me, Steve. Thanks. Have a good day. Thanks. Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139.